after failing to conquer Kyiv in the western Ukraine, Russian forces increased focus, they increased the focus of their assaults on the Donbas region in what appears to be an attempt to create a land corridor from Crimea to eastern Ukraine. The Russian army also took the notable measure today of test launching an intercontinental ballistic missile, which Russian President Vladimir Putin said should cause anyone threatening his country to, quote, think twice. Now, throughout all this, the Ukrainian army continues to fight on. Joining me now to discuss the war in Ukraine, along with the U.S. domestic issues such as the mask mandate repeal and the crisis at the border, is Representative Pat Fallon. Representative Fallon serves on the Armed Services Committee, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, and represents the 4th District in Texas. Representative Fallon, good to see you today. Joseph, how are you doing? I am well. Glad to have you. Uh, let's start in Ukraine. Um, the focus for the Russian military clearly has focused to the Donbass region. Uh, what can you tell us about the developments there? Well, yeah, certainly they failed abject and, and miserably uh, trying to take Kiev. And so what Putin has to do now is he needs some kind of an exit strategy, and he needs to show his upper echelon, Joseph, and his people that the Russians gain something from this, you know, this colossal disaster. And that, as you mentioned just recently, uh, or just a second ago, is probably a, a creating a land bridge from Mother Russia into the Crimea. And if he can do that, he can kind of, uh, if he would so chose, because really, this is not only an economic siege, it's also a military one in so much as Putin doesn't have an inexhaustible uh, amount of material and resources. And he's stretching his uh, capacity is very thin, Joseph, and they can't really continue at this pace for much longer. So he needs some kind of a win. And if he can be denied that win by the Ukrainian fighters, it'll be very interesting to see what his next move will be. Now, what in what could be a concerning development, Russia conducted an intercontinental ballistic missile test today. It seemed to be an implied nuclear threat. What do you think the appropriate response to that is? Honestly, right now, just ignore it because he's a bully and he's been everything. Every time something has gone bad, Putin rattles the saber and threatens some kind of a, a, a nuclear a launch or, so, you know, implies, as you said, in hopes the West infers that there is some kind of risk of World War Three. Biden himself has fallen into that trap. You do not let the the Russian dictator dict, you know, uh, really, really dictate the terms to the United States or, or NATO for that matter, or the West. The president of the United States should be uh, you know, creating policies and uh, making Putin uh, react to our strength and not be afraid of something that really, uh, you know, obviously it's a, a nightmare scenario, but I don't think it's realistic in so much as Putin can't do this himself and his leadership would have to follow a nuclear order. And I don't believe they will. I think they'll kill him if he orders that, a strike like that. And so to that point, you're, you're correct, I think, in that the White House has been concerned about provoking the Russian mm -hmm. government and, and Vladimir Putin uh, with their actions. Do you think the White House's posture is changing as this war moves on, as things continue to go poorly militarily for Russia? Is that emboldening the White House to be um, more, uh, more aggressive in its response? Well, Joseph, I think really, honestly, to, to be very candid with you, I think one of the ways that we have been, that, that Biden has grown a little bit more bold is because he's following the leadership on the Hill, the bipartisan leadership from Democrats and Republicans that have seen this for what it was, which was you know a, a gross violation of the international norms, international law. This is a criminal act of a nation state. And instead, again, of letting Putin deter the United States, Biden should be deterring Putin. And they, you can see this with these recent arms shipments that have been uh, taking a great toll on, on the Russian army. And we, it can't be understated, the will, determination, and courage of the Ukrainian fighters has been spectacular. And it's one that's really awe-inspiring. And I think they're just, by and large, they have, they're done with the Russian corruption. They're done with the heavy-handedness. And they want to get them out of their country and then rebuild, move on, and integrate into the West.
Now, Ukraine President Zelensky has said that he believes the war would already be over if the Allies had provided more weapons earlier when they had been requested. Here's how the Pentagon responded to that. I understand President Zelensky wants as much as he can as fast as he can, too. I mean, his country's under siege. It's under attack. I perfectly understand that. Um, but we've got to make sure that we're helping him in, in the most effective way. And we believe we are. Uh, what's your response to that? Are we helping them in the most effective way? I, I, again, I'll be very frank. We could have done more earlier. And I signed on to a letter back in November urging uh, Mr. Biden to send more asymmetrical and military aid then. He did not. He dragged his feet inexplicably for six weeks. Now, having said that, would the war be over if the president had followed uh, Re Re Ranking Member Rogers and Enhoff and my request? No, probably not. But the Ukrainians would be in a much better position. I think that uh, the, the Kyiv assault would have ended sooner. I think they'd be in a much better position in Maripol and in eastern Ukraine. And they're uh, probably along the Black Sea coast as well. And you saw that with the Russians, their flagship being sunk, the cruiser. And you know we provide the Ukrainians with the harpoons and the stingers and the switchblade drones and the S-300 anti-aircraft and uh, anti-tank mines and uh, the javelins have been, you know, have been used to great effect, then there's going to be at best for Putin a stalemate, and a stalemate is a loss. And um, then he's going to have to tuck tail and leave. And this is kind of starting to, it's early, right? It's only been two months, but this has kind of got the makings of Afghanistan 2.0 for the Russians. And we're speaking with Congressman Pat Fallon and Congressman Fallon, I am going to change topics with you and I want to discuss the border briefly. This might be another area in which we're seeing a shift in the White House's position. Title 42 has been discussed at great length recently by a Trump administration policy that required asylum seekers to wait for their asylum to be processed while they were outside the country on the other side of the border. The White House, the Biden White House, had said they were going to repeal Title 42. That has now received bipartisan opposition, in part because of the, uh, the numbers uh, that we are seeing at the border. Now the Biden administration is signaling perhaps they will not repeal Title 42. What's your assessment of this situation? Well, Joseph, there were really two things that President Trump did that took a flood of illegal immigration and reduced it to a trickle. And one was the migrant protection protocols, what you're just mentioning, which was you will, if you have an asylum claim, you will wait in Mexico while that claim is adjudicated. And two, Title 42, which said, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic and a national emergency, so we're going to deny entry simply based on that, because we have, you know, of course, COVID to deal with and contend with. Now, I found it ironic and very hypocritical that Joe Biden, the first 10 months of his administration, wouldn't allow anybody to come to the United States, a tourist that would come legally from anywhere in the world, even if they were vaccinated and tested negative upon arrival, because the pandemic was just too much of a threat. Yet he looked the other way when 2 million people illegally crossed the border and only about 55% of them were repatted back to Mexico. So they've been inconsistent. And what we saw was they wanted to get all, to you know, project weakness and wokeness by saying, you know what, we're gonna do away with Title 42. And even though we were seeing the greatest surge for a march in 20 years, 221,000 people crossed the border illegally and were apprehended in about 60, 70,000 known gotaways. So probably well over 300,000 people crossed illegally just last month. And he wanted to rescind Title 42, even though he knew that of the 221,000 that crossed illegally and were apprehended, 55% were sent back. If you wanna just let everybody in, because that's a de facto open border. And that's what the left really looks like they want which is anybody in the world can just come to the, uh, the border, the southern border and say, I have credible fear that I'll be harmed in my home country, please let me in. And they're perfectly fine with doing that. But you've seen Democrats push back because it's an election year and they know that they're gonna get, sw they're gonna get smashed up in, the, uh, the, in November in the election if this continues. So do you think the rumblings that the Biden administration mm -hmm. is reconsidering their decision to repeal Title 42 has legs to it? Is there a possibility that they don't repeal it? That's always possible. And the only reason why they're doing it is a political decision. It's not a policy decision. Their policy is de facto open borders. And I really believe that their policy is to flood Texas with as many uh, illegal immigrants as possible from all over the world in the hopes that their, their descendants will vote for the Democratic Party. 
that will be, <clears throat> they won't have the skill set to succeed in a 21st century developed economy, and therefore they'll vote for more freebies from the government. It just, because nothing else makes sense. This is completely insane to put American interests last. We're already a debtor nation. There is already talk of, um, out of this White House that we're going to have food shortages. We are, we're going to have fuel shortages. And yet you're going to allow two, three, four million illegal immigrants to come into the country in, in a given year. This is madness. Congressman Fallon, one final issue, and we only have about a minute. The big decision this week out of the court in Florida that the travel mask mandate had been thrown out. The Biden administration now considering uh, an appeal of that. Where do you think this is going? You know what? They can do what they want. I was just I just flew Joseph yesterday and it wasn't like the press is reporting. Half the people are happy the, ma the mask mandate's gone and half aren't. Ninety percent of the people on both planes I was on did not have masks on. 90% of the people in the airport, and I walk by hundreds. So this isn't anecdotal. This is scientific at this point. M looking, 90% didn't have masks on. So they are completely out of touch with the American people. Here in Texas, hospitalizations due to COVID have gone down 96%. And let me say that again, 96% in the last three months. In a state of 30 million people, only uh, less than 800 people are hospitalized due to COVID. The pandemic is over. COVID is not, but the national emergency is. Well, I am planning to fly tomorrow and I am looking forward to it. Congressman Fallon, we greatly appreciate your time very much. Thanks for being with Thanks, us. Thanks, Joseph.